might stand up, I might uh, lie down. Those sheets are made for me, by the way, <laughs> to sleep on. I'm very glad that um, my two colleagues are not sitting in the front two seats here. I was very worried. Because some time ago, a few years ago, um, I had two colleagues sitting in the front. And I was told to speak very slowly because people was, English was not their first language. So I was speaking very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> and then one colleague, a good friend of mine, turned to the other and said, why is Hamdi speaking so slowly? And the other friend turned to him and said, Hamdi speaks slowly because Hamdi thinks slowly. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, I decided to put the sheets on the floor and go to rest. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to occupy you for the next 40 minutes or so, and then hopefully if there are any uh, questions, discussions, we can have those with lots of time. Sorry about the delay. Uh, we were enjoying the Delhi, Delhi traffic. <laughs> Very nice. I think lights, you need the lights on. I need the lights on. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's not, it's not so much that, 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 that you can see me, you see, not the slides. <laughs> okay. Let me start off with this image. Uh, and I always like to start off even the most general of discussions um, on the ground, in the street. Someone once said, if you're involved in, whether you're planner, architect, engineer, but involved in the development business, when you land wherever you land, or you arrive wherever you arrive by plane, don't go straight to the planning office, don't go straight to the architecture office. Walk through the streets of anywhere. And by the time you get to the planning office, you will probably have enough questions and more knowledge than by sitting for a whole week in the planning office trying to understand what the heck is going on, right? But I want you to stare into that picture. So imagine that we've landed on the street. Imagine we're walking through the streets of anywhere. And it doesn't matter where this is. Some of you may recognize it. And ask yourselves, just think for a minute, ask yourselves, what's public, what's private? What about sanitation? Who owns what in this image here? How do the kids get to school? Where do they play? Are they playgrounds? Streets? What happens when it rains? Where does the rubbish go? Who picks it up? Electricity. Who gets it? From whom? Who sells it to whom? Is there a concept of community? We talk about community participation enormously. Is this one community? Is it homogeneous? Are there any conflicts of opinion? Or even worse? Is this a concept of order or disorder? Is the place consolidating or deteriorating? Which state it's in? Is it, as one of my colleagues once said, is it a place of despair or is it a place of hope? And where are the boundaries? The visible ones are very clear, but what about the invisible boundaries? How does this place connect to the rest of the place that it's in, the rest of the city? Many people say that the concept of community in cities increasingly is networked and not place-based. And that's an important issue when it comes to participation. Who are we working with? We talk about community as if it was a nice, homogeneous whole. It makes me feel very good when I say, I like working with communities. And somebody said to me, where is it? And I looked around and it was very dispersed. Anyway, by the time we get to this point, most, at least architects, maybe not the planners or urban designers, most architects will have either um, switched off or nodded off. Because they'll be asking themselves, what's this got to do with me? This is not about architecture. Can I see any architecture here? No. Or is it? Yeah. It's certainly not what I was taught as an architect what architecture is. It's beyond my discipline. I have nothing to do with this place. More recently, more recently today, I hear students and young professionals increasingly asking, I love my architecture, I love my engineering, I love my planning, but I also want to be relevant. 
environmentally relevant, socially relevant, politically relevant even. And for a long while, I pondered what that meant. What do you mean relevant? I mean, surely anything you do is relevant. A house you put up, a you design, a shop you design, a tent you put up, surely must be relevant. So I came to terms with the fact that actually what they were saying when I want to be relevant is that I want to make a real difference. It's one thing to make a difference locally, here, but the question I get asked when I show case studies to students and young professionals all over the world, they look at me, the best students, and they say, that's a nice project, but so what? And what do you mean, so what? It's a nice project. So, what? <coughs> and of course, what they're asking is, how does it really explore the concept of change in a way that makes a difference, not just locally, but regionally, nationally, and even globally? And that's what I find is increasingly happening amongst the students and young professionals. They're coming back and saying, I do not want to become an economist or a politician. I want to become an architect. But I also want to be relevant. I first discovered what the concept of relevance meant, that whole business of being strategic. For me, I translated being relevant as being strategic. And that was a bit ambiguous, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But I first discovered what that meant with my very first project in London. Uh, and not by intent either. It was just by more, more or less accident. I was working with uh, poor families in London, council tenants, we call them, uh, social housing families. Uh, and it was one of the first projects that the Greater London Council were doing in engaging with people to design their own homes. This was not a usual thing to do. How do we work with families to design their own homes? And you could say, well, you know, that's why, why do we need that? We've done our surveys. We know what families need. Yes, but, you know, you find a two-person apartment, which is usually a double bedroom and a single uh, kitchen dining area, and you find that a couple of people have been sitting on the waiting list, which is a mother and her daughter. And they've been on the waiting list for five years because the council does not build two-person apartments with two single bedrooms. Simple things like this. Okay. But importantly, what I discovered in terms of the strategic agenda is that whilst I was working with these families, something else was happening. Um, I, we made little books that the families could take away to design their own homes, furniture you can cut out, they could bring it back, and we could talk about it and things like this. So it was a really wonderful um, experience for me. Some of the families took the, they were teachers, so they took the books to schools, and they got the kids to start designing things. Some of them began to exchange information. What I found was happening in parallel with my talking to families was that there was a concept of community developing. People collaborating and exchanging ideas. Oh, well, that's lovely. <laughs> did you do that again? That was really actually quite nice. <laughs> it made it much more interesting. Everybody suddenly woken up, which is wonderful. So the concept of community began to arise, and I thought, that's wonderful. But not only that, things that I hadn't even thought of at that age, which was that the uh, process challenged conventional uh, uh, sort of building regulations and standards. Right? So, for example, uh, on one hand, we in London would decide the number of uh, the, the density on the basis of the number of habitable rooms per acre. Well, we didn't know the number of rooms because we hadn't talked to the families yet. We didn't even know the number of people, which was the basis of the subsidy. So then changes to policy were occurring which I didn't know about. I always say that my most creative work was done when I, when I was at most my, my most naive. You know? If I had known that these were going to be the big imp impulses, I probably would not have started. As the saying goes, thinking too much can sometimes interrupt performance. <coughs> and I gave my colleagues here the wonderful example the other day of the centipede. Everyone knows what a centipede is? Walks like mad with 100 legs and so on. And somebody one day stopped and said, I said, when you walk, which leg do you move first? And he started thinking about it and it couldn't move. It froze to the ground. Thinking too much interrupts performance. Anyway, that was my first discovery as we began to understand what strategic began to mean. There are another two important events, two, maybe three, I suppose, important events that changed my attitude to things. One was uh, a meeting of the American Institute of Architects when I was teaching at MIT uh, and they were talking about the subject, I think, was the meaning and purpose of architecture. Great title. And they were talking and talking and talking and talking. And then an anthropologist colleague of mine stood up at the back and said, why is it 
every time you architects meet, you talk about the meaning and purpose of architecture. You can either go and do that for the next 30, 40 years, or you can just stop and become relevant. And I worried about getting into this kind of business because I was losing my design, my architect. I love architecture, for example. But at that point, I started not to worry about it because my architecture was still going to be there, but placed under a different set of rules, different circumstances. Now what's going to happen to it? And at that point, I can choose. Oh, what's happening to it is not a good idea. I'm not going to get into this business. Or I can say, great, let's redraw the boundaries to make myself relevant. Another changing event for me was a book by um, a fellow called John Turner. Uh, it was called Housing by People, I think, in which he said a lot of things, but one of the things that still sticks with me to this day, and I'll come back to it later on, what housing does is equally, if not more important than what it is. And I wondered about this. I said, what the heck's this guy talking about? We know what a house is, technically, environmentally, perhaps even, etc. But what it does in building a sense of belonging, giving you security, giving you a sense of identity, cultural identity, teaching you skills, generating employment, giving you a place in which your children can go to school because you finally got an address, all of that is equally, if not more important, than what a house is. I can design a house in a couple of days, but the, that's the is. The does agenda is the development agenda. What it does is we need to engage in order to become more strategic. Again, at that point, we are drawing the boundaries too big or not big enough. And that's a question and a decision in terms of all of our careers. And then finally, just by, this is all by way of introduction. Have you people got two hours or so, is it? That, that, that's okay, yes. two hours? Yes. Okay, that's fine. The UN some years ago estimated that something like 5% of all building work in the expanding cities of the South, whatever you call, call it, is actually planned or designed. Now, I don't care if it's 5% or 10%, but it's a very small percentage of cities that's actually designed and planned. If that's right, Let's assume for a moment it is, and I ask myself, why is it that some 95% of architects go chasing 5% of the jobs, when we know that the real issues are in the other 95%? Okay, just ask yourself that question. It's okay. You'll sleep well tonight. <laughs> As the saying goes, there's nothing more dangerous than a student walking out of a classroom feeling satisfied. You want the students to walk out feeling just a little disturbed and comfortable. Oh dear. So I'm going to be watching you very carefully when you leave the room. But those who leave early, of course, will be disqualified. <laughs> so what does it take then, is my big question, or has been my question over time, what does it ta take to be rigorous to your architecture, but at the same time relevant to some of the big issues that we face out there, however you want to define them, which now today land on all our desks. They cannot be just somebody else's problem. However you interpret it. What I've learned over the years was that being relevant meant being strategic, as I said. Engaging what I would like to call the humanitarian in placemaking. That's one of, the big, one of the big agendas. And in this case, there are four groups of things to think about that I just want to go through quite, quick, quite quick, quickly. One is about ethics. The second is about the life and organization of place. The third about, is about rights, the issue of human rights. And the fourth category is the difference it makes to us in terms of our roles, responsibilities, and relationships to people in place. That fundamentally has to change. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a second. Let me just start with ethics. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because this could take two or three hours. Um, there are three aspects of ethics that have engaged me that I find very <coughs> interesting. One is the issue of complicity. We had a debate at the Royal Institute of British Architects some time ago in which I was helping out, um, as to whether or not we are complicit in some of the wrongs that are happening out there. <coughs> the meaning and definition of complicity is either being a party to something that's illegal or morally wrong. Well, let's take evictions. Let's take the wonderful um, 400,000 people or so that were evicted in Beijing when they had the Olympics there. Yeah? made space for some of the wonderful buildings, lovely architecture, whatever you want to call it, and so on. The debate was, 
Were architects complicit in that? Of course it was not illegal. But was it morally wrong to base our wonderful and beautiful buildings on the fact that people had to be not even relocated, just evicted, which is a different concept? And some people took different sides of the view, and I'd be interested to hear your view. On the one hand, people said, look, I'm an architect. You give me the money, you give me the site, you give me the client, you give me the brief, and I design buildings. Can you really adopt that position? Because the other side said, well, actually, we have that influence and we have that power to have a say. How am I going to say that? How am I going to be involved in that? You know, without getting into trouble. How do I learn to work with what we call the bad guys? I like working with bad guys. They're my best friends. Um, some say, again, when it comes to complicity, some say that ethics gets in the way of good business. When we start talking about complicity or even, uh, you, you know, whether we're a party to these, to these issues, are we actually engaging ethics in a way that gets in the way of good business? We had some time ago uh, a debate, I think it was when I was teaching in the States, amongst the business school there, whether ethics should be a subject for business school. And the idea was rejected because ethics gets in the way of good business. Again, really, really debatable issue. Um, one of our wonderful prime ministers, Harold Macmillan, said some years ago, um, economics isn't about ethics or morality. He said that if people want morality, let them get it from their archbishops. That's one heck of a position to be taking. The second aspect of ethics is the issue of universal absolutes. Are there universal absolutes? You know, uh, gender equality is not negotiable. That's a universal absolute. And again, amongst my students at Harvard a couple of years ago, we had a debate about yes, there were absolutes, and no, there weren't. The conclusion we came to was You can't actually say what's good or what's bad, because right and wrong can only be decided according to cultural and environmental context. Yep. You can take all sorts of aspects, like cooking on open fires and various other examples. But the important thing was, there were universal absolutes when it came to values, which is after all what the Human Rights Agenda, the United Nations, the, the UN Human Rights Agenda is based on. There are universal values, but the application of those values can only be context-specific. So yes, gender equality is not negotiable, but how it's applied and how it's worked through and how it's discovered and how it's made will vary from place to place, and that from place to place it will take different kinds of time as well. Again, debatable. Some of you may say no. Um, it's interesting because I'm going to try and... There's somebody quoted here as a word that I can't even pronounce. <coughs> People who speak of good or bad as absolutes are absolutizing the norms of their own society. They take the norms they were taught to be, to, uh, to be effective facts and impose them on others. And that's a big question. Whose values count in the context of a globalized world? What are we exporting? Yeah. What do we share and what do we not share? And one of the principles in all participatory work for me at various levels, global, regional, national, and around the local level, is how do we converge interests, because we all share some interests in climate change, for example, but at the same time respect differences. Because we know that when we just converge interests, it becomes top-down or whatever you want to call it. You know, the West decides everything. And if we just base our work on differences, then it's chaos. Everybody's doing their own thing. We all share values. We all share certain things that are part of our structure. I'll come back to that again a little bit more. The third aspect of ethics, and I won't take too long on this, is the neg what I call the, trying to discover and make explicit the negative side of positive. Uh, and for that matter, sometimes the positive side of negative, but I'll keep that aside. The assumption there is that everything that we do, everything that we actually make, uh, may be great, but it won't be great for everybody, and it certainly won't be great in the same way for everybody. 
And there are circumstances, in fact, in which some people might even be harmed. Yeah. So the question really is, uh, how do we excavate and understand what those might be? And there are various techniques of doing that in participant planning, like the stakeholder analysis, where you actually look at which stakeholders will benefit most, which stakeholder has the most say, and that sort of thing. We tend, we are taught to hide the negative side of positive. We're taught to be defensive. Because after all, if you actually expose your weaknesses in terms of impact in this case, you're considered to be professionally weak. So I've been really skilled at knowing, at just arguing what's strong about my proposal, not about the limitations of that proposal. And I'm reversing that and saying that it's even more strength in exposing the negatives and the weaknesses, because then we can provide safety nets then we can provide other uh, solutions that may not be the same, but different. Oh. Odd. I'm quoting Tony Judge now. Tony Judd. The, um, yeah, that's good. Um, increasingly, when asking ourselves whether we support a proposal or initiative, we tend not to talk as, it, as if it's good or bad. Instead, we inquire, is it efficient? Is it productive? This propensity to avoid the moral consideration to restrict ourselves to issues of profit and loss econo and, and loss economically um, is, is, the narrowest, is in the narrowest sense not an instinctive human condition. Yeah? Tony Judge is actually saying that this is not, you know, we understand good or bad, but efficiency and, and economic effectiveness, we've made all that up. A key to understanding ethics is understanding the structure and organization of place. Uh, and here I just want to kind of, that's the second big category of understanding, engaging the human in development. Um, we need to recognize, I think the first, right from the outset, we need to recognize that there are at least two kinds of organizations in any of the places that we see, uh, and they're not equ equally represented. On the one hand, there are what we call emergent organizations. Yep. These are small, self-organizing, creative, flexible. They respond to needs. Uh, they're ingenious. They're incredibly productive. In the language of emergence, it's better to build a densely interconnected system with simple elements and let the more sophisticated behavior and organization trickle up. But all human societies also need design structures, not just emergent ones physical, spatial, legal, institutional, with rights, standards, routines, rituals, all of which provide continuity and stability, sort of shared context of meaning and purpose, a shared sense of place. That's the convergence, as it were. Those structures are designed. And as Isaiah Berlin once said, it is to these structures that we give up some of our individual liberties in order to protect the rest. The question is, how much liberty are you prepared to give up in order to protect the rest. Uh, leaving, knowing that, how much liberty to give up, knowing that not enough is not helpful, it doesn't lead you anywhere, too much becomes very concentrated. It locks you into systems which are top heavy with rules, regulations, standards to which you have to comply. Compliance to systems, if you go too heavy with the design structures, compliance to systems takes precedence over attention to people. When that happens, systems become self-serving. There's one wonderful example that I always love, love to quote, uh, done by the Confederation of Building, Confeder Confederation of uh, C the CBI, the Confederation of uh, Business Institutes, or whatever it's called, in, in England. Uh, and they interviewed bus drivers because they had lots of complaints from the public that buses were not stopping at bus stops. And even to this day, you occasionally have to wave them down and so on. And the resounding conclusion they had from the bus drivers was, how can you stick to timetables if you have to keep stopping for passengers? <laughs> kind of lost the purpose of the bus, you know? Self-serving systems as such. So that's the second important unraveling, the relation between emergent structures, the creative, spontaneous, and the design structures. Again, too much design, top down. Too much emergence, chaos. Where do we stand here? I'm not sure. Is this chaotic? Is this disorder? Or is it an order of a very different kind? 
The third set of considerations is in the context of engaging the, particularly in the context of engaging the humanitarian, is rights, the issue of rights. Uh, and that's a big subject in its own right, but let me summarize. Rights of access to essential resources, I use uh, David Sanderson's livelihoods model for this particular one. Rights of access to essential resources to meet basic needs, to build resilience. We all need access to resources to meet our basic needs, to enable us to build safety nets so that we're resilient to the shocks and stresses of daily life. These rights of access are sometimes blocked for cultural reasons. You know, sometimes women cannot own land, for example, or uh, certain uh, families are not, uh, they don't have easy access to schools, whatever it might be. Sometimes they're economic, sometimes they're political, sometimes they are on the basis of ethnic discrimination. In strategic practice, has to be able to impact policy in ways which enhance access to those resources. How do we begin to remove some of those standards that get in the way of people be, being able to own their own house when they don't have access, for example, to borrowing money, whatever it might be? Again, how to engage rights in placemaking. And I'd like to just take one little example to illustrate why I think it's an important aspect of it and why it's integral to all our disciplines. Again, it's easy here to say rights. Uh, I, I'm an architect, you know, I, I don't, human rights is somebody else's problem. No? But let me take a, an, an example of that. A simplistic model assumes when we say the right to housing, usually that interprets as the right to own a house. That is usually an architect's interpretation um, because it's a simple way of making complex systems manageable. You know, if I can bring it down to designing a house, then I can design and deliver. It's in the same way as we oversimplify the concept of education, become schools, play, playgrounds, shopping, shopping malls. We actually make very complex processes into simple things, and so we can deal with them. But the right to housing is much, much more inclusive. If I was to say right to housing, and I think to myself, what has it got to do with me? Well, first of all, it's the right to land, for example. It may not be ownership, but it may be... Uh, at least secure tenure. Uh, there are different forms of ownership, corporate ownership, land trusts, and so on. Those may be appropriate to different kinds of people, all part of the housing program. The right of access to materials. There are certain countries that have ac no access at all. Gaza, cannot imp Gaza in the Middle East cannot import any materials because they're blocked. So people are building out of rubble. The right to knowledge and information and skills through, for example, training and how to build, how to recycle materials into building components. Now, that surely has to be part of our business. Uh, and we can show you lots of wonderful examples of the most creative houses made out of recycled materials. But with little training, we can actually improve, uh, through knowledge and information, the employability of people. And then there's the incremental house. Do people want their house all at the same time? No, the right to housing may be the right to be able to start and then to build hope through building housing incrementally. I have a future, but I can't have it now. So you don't come along and say, sorry, you can't do that. You come along and say, yes, you can, but you have to start somewhere else. That's the incremental house. That's the right, an absolute key right to housing, rather than saying no, as such. In any case, all of these things are about what the house does, not just what it is. And all of this is integral, from my point of view, to the design activity, whether it's in planning, whether it's in architecture. Not just of things, the design of things, but the design of processes. Design as a process of enablement, which I'll come to in a second. All of which, of course, challenges the conventions of practice, um, even as our own <coughs> schools and universities teach it. And I have as much criticism in terms of our educational program that teaches me more about the what is, not, not the does, of housing. Which leads me to the fourth and final important consideration when it comes to engaging the humanitarian or the development agenda in placemaking, and that is the changing roles and responsibilities of urban professionals, all urban professionals. <coughs> in my book, Housing Without Houses, some of you have seen that, I think, I argued prolifically that we should stop providing housing and instead enable people to provide for themselves. And since then, I've slightly changed my position because there's always something that has to be provided. And my, my, my contention is that every time we pick up a pencil or 
to your typing on the computer, whatever you do these days. Every time we do that, we invoke four sets of integrally related responsibilities. And I call it my PEAS, my PEAS methodology. Certainly, charity on its own introduces a moral superiority amongst the charitable. I feel very good when I'm giving. And I have to ask myself, actually, is it really for me that I'm giving is it, or is it for them? Yeah, and whatever it is, I do believe in charity, but it's not sustainable in its own right. In fact, if one isn't careful, it creates dependency. So the first really is, how do we, what is it we need to provide? And we cannot answer that unless we go to the next one, which is what is it we're trying to enable. And I can unravel enablement in four respects. One is there's community enablement, which is about capacities, uh, about skills, ability to access resources, and that sort of thing. Political enablement, which is about looking at standards, looking at discrimination within our standards that prevent access to essential resources to meet basic needs. Market enablement, which is about inventing new forms of partnership, um, about uh, uh, social enterprises, just looking at a different kind of economy that is locally based that might trickle up and in, in influence and inform the global economy in some way. And then there is design enablement. What does design look like as a process of enablement? Cultivating an environment of choice and opportunity. What does it do, look like an architecture of choice, an architecture of opportunity? Encouraging improvisation in search of order. All right? The kind of order that liberates the resourcefulness of others rather than confines it to second rate. Based on differences, not samenesses. Design as a process of enablement mediates power relations. You suddenly find that happening because it involves people. I'm enabling people to be involved and so on. All of which places artists, architects, planners in a different and profoundly social relationship to people in place. What does it mean to design an architecture of opportunity and an architecture of enablement? It's a very different kind of uh, uh, pro process that, that is engaged. That's the provision. That's the E for the enablement. And then things have to change. The A is about adapting. We accept that places change and grow in order to sustain a good fit between people and place. So the question then is, how do we make places fit for change? Not how do we prevent them. So much of our work is about stopping people interfering with their design processes. So much of our work, which is against the participatory process, is let's get people out of the way so that we can be creative. In order to change the fit, how do we make places fit for change? That's the big issue. Uh, and there are a number of examples uh, that I can give you of how that's done, but we can talk about that in discussion later. How do we invite change in order to create an architecture of opportunity, an architecture of invitation? How should we design in order to liberate rather than confine all the ingenuity and incredible resourcefulness that we know that there is in this place? How do we do that? And the final word is sustain, S. How do we sustain things? How do we keep them going? Uh, and uh, the example I'm going to give you of the best definition of a had is well known by my, my colleagues and family here, uh, but I'm going to tell it to you in any case. I love to collect uh, signs when we're walking around these kinds of neighborhoods. They tell a lot about place as such. So you get, you know, um, head shine and shoe shine. We work at both ends. Fantastic. It's a barber shop. You polish your shoes as well as cut your hair. Very, very obvious. Barber shop, we also sell bicycle parts. Why not? What's the relationship between that? The one, I, one of the ones that are really creative is Wally the Undertaker with the last to let you down. All right? But the one that stopped us, and we had to talk to the guy, was the sustainable barber shop. We went in and sort of talked to the guy, and I expected to see recycled grey water, a um, copy of the Brandon report on his desk. We said to the guy, this was in South Africa, what actually is a sustainable barber shop? And he thought for a minute, he said to himself, he'd never been asked this question before. He said, well, when my clients come in, I cut just enough hair so they're satisfied. <laughs> but not too much so they come back sooner than later. <laughs> this guy was trying to keep his business going. He was not trying to save the world. And that's got to be the starter. Providing catalysts in whatever form Enabling the capacity for change, ensuring a good, good fit, defining a culture of practice both practical in its objectives and strategic in its purpose, with a strong commitment from all to share in the future, which begins now, 
gives us a definition of sustainability guided by an agenda which is both practical and at the same time moral. Let me end with a little quote, uh, a little dissection of what all this might mean in terms of our competencies. What does it actually mean in terms of our... And here I go back to the wonderful Aristotle. My colleague Hugo Slim, in one of my books, wrote, Aristotle understood that there to be two intellectual virtues, wisdom and prudence, and that each is the virtue of a different part of the, book, of the brain and of the soul. He recognized both as distinct from each other, and he also believed that they were attained in different ways. He defined wisdom as both scientific knowledge and intuitive intelligence as regards the things that most exalted nature. The wise person, therefore, has great understanding and great knowledge, but it is of a higher order which does not always lend itself to action, let alone the right action. But more use, perhaps, and certainly of more impact in the affairs of the world, therefore, is the virtue of prudence, which Aristotle recognized as practical wisdom. Practical wisdom has three types of characteristics. Deliberative excellence, this is what he said, which is the ability to weigh up, analyze, and deliberate toward the right decision with careful attention to context and specific consideration, particularly empathy. Understanding, based as much on empathy as on the scientific knowledge, and shared between disciplines. Here we're back come to peer group prediction of knowledge, the peer group production of knowledge. You know, how do we share that? We kind of resist that again. And the third aspect of practical wisdom is good judgment. Judging correctly what is just and equitable based on ethical considerations, on disciplinary criteria, on interdisciplinary understanding of, of that relationship, and all the other issues that confront us when we're designing a housing program or whatever it might be. All of which are fundamental to building resilience and ensuring social sustainability, all fundamental to deciding how best to decide interventions, and fundamental to building an open humanitarian architecture, one built on the basis of knowledge and information that is grassrooted. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.